Hello, I'm Paul Merrill from Beaufort Fairmont Automated Testing Services and today we're going to talk about data strategies. I'm actually going to go deeper into this. So you may have seen a presentation like this in the past by me where we went over at a high level what these different data strategies were. Today we're going to go deep into them and I'm going to show you examples of each and we're going to walk through them together. So join me as we talk about data strategies. Once again, Paul Merrill, you can find me on Twitter at dpaulmerrill. So first, a few things that are upcoming. Today is the 13th of February, 2017, and these are a few things in the near future that are coming up. I'll be in Raleigh at TISCA talking about machine learning and how it affects t testers on the 23rd. On the 27th, I'll be starting a course called Test Driven Development in Java, and that's gonna be 20% off by the 15th if you register by then, so just a couple of days for that from today. The 8th, I'll be doing a webinar for QA Symphony, and that'll be called what testers should auto what tests should we automate first i'm looking forward to that and finally on the 30th i'll be out at triagile in raleigh talking about agile testing patterns from the outside in last year i did one from the inside out and this is the opposite from the outside in so hopefully you'll join me at triagile really great agile testing conference here in the raleigh area also in in, in april i'll be out at quality jam in atlanta so look for me there. I hope to meet all of you when I get a chance and when we bump into each other in the same place. So the agenda for today is basically we're gonna talk about an overview of several of these strategies. And then we're gonna walk through some examples. So from a very high level, the reason that I started getting into talking about this and studying it for myself was I realized that as we're writing test cases, the main reasons why tests either don't work when you run them repeatedly or don't work when you run them in parallel is because of something outside of the test itself and generally something outside of the application code. It's something persisted outside of that application. Now sometimes that's a database, sometimes it's a file system. It can be lots of different things and I refer to each of those as data sources. Sometimes it's even third party APIs, things of that nature. So these things that are persisted outside of our tests, outside of our application, these are the, the things that I wanted to get into and figure out how to deal with. Basically we have a race condition going on when two tests are trying to use the same piece of data and one modifies it and then the other tries to use it and now it's in a modified state. So those are the things I wanted to get into. Uh, in order to just kind of get us started and define terms here, a data strategy I'm calling uh, a data strategy, the combination of code, procedure, and infrastructure that affect how tests interact with data to stimulate the system under test. And I use those terms very intentionally. Sometimes we just mean to stim the system under test, not necessarily to test it or to verify it. But a strategy has two parts. And these two parts are the creational part of the strategy and the cleanup part, part of the strategy. And they basically are what they say. So the way that we create data is the creational strategy. The way that we clean it up is the cleanup strategy. Here are a few examples of data strategies. We're just gonna go through three and they are three of the basic ones. The elementary approach. So basically the elementary approach has no cleanup and no creation strategy. That's what makes it elementary. A simple example of this that you may recall and may have gone through is the idea that when you first create your first test case, you write out this, this script and you go in, let's say that we're trying to change the user's password. So you'll use a user that already exists in the system with a password that's already been created. You log into the system, go to where you changed the password, change the password, and log out. Now, that's a very simple script, a very simple test script that we're prescribing there. But what you can realize very quickly is that if you try to run through this script again, it's not gonna work. And the reason is, that the password has changed. So there's a place where the password being that piece of data that's modified in such a way that we can't run this test case multiple times in a row. The way that I like to envision that is these executions on the left from top to bottom, multiple executions of the same test script running against the system under test, which is using a data source. Uh, you see here that in blue, you have an execution number one that worked and then a red, the second, third, and any subsequent executions do not work. So that's the idea of the elementary approach. And remember, these executions may be one execution of a particular test script. It may be the execution of a test suite, um, but basically it's, it's the idea of execution that's going on here. So refresh data source would be the second strategy that I wanna talk about. Its creation strategy is basically the same as the elementary strategy. 
where we assume that certain data is in the data source and we work with it uh, because it's easy to use and because it's there. The cleanup strategy here is a little different. So we're doing whatever we have to do to get the data source back to a benign state. And that state may be something like resetting back to a previous version of this application. Maybe you have a snapshot of the database. Maybe you have a virtual, um, a, a virtual system that you can go back to an earlier snapshot of. Maybe you delete all the data in the database and go back to a completely clean database. And that's actually the example that I'm going to use, although it's a very simplistic one. That's the one that we're going to use today as we go through the code and the test cases to do this. But refresh could be something like getting a new cut of code out of production or a new cut of data out of production, things like that. So refresh data source. And as you can see here, between executions, we're doing a refresh on this data source. And so each of these executions work. Um, the tests continue to run, they run each time because we can make assumptions on the data because we know exactly what's going to be there and we control it. Selfish data generation, the third one and final one that we're going to talk about today is the idea that tests create exactly the data that they need or we, if you're in a manual situation where you're doing hands-on testing, maybe you actually create the data that you need for that test case. So imagine our example again, and if you went in and created a user each time that you did this, and the user was unique each time you did this test case, well, it doesn't matter if you change the password. The next running of the test case will work because you have a new user and a new password to work with. So the idea is that we create only what we need. The reason that it's called selfish is because we don't care about anybody else. We don't care about any other test cases. We don't care how our creation of data uh, impacts the system or anyone who's using the system. So that's why it's called selfish. We're selfish about what we create. We use it for our own needs. We don't care about how anyone else is affected. So here you see data being created between each execution and, uh, and running against the system under test. And this can work quite well. You see each of these test cases passing. So let's jump into some code right away here. So today I'm going to be working on an application that is called an invoice, uh, it's an invoice manager. And I had a, a employee of mine make this up. It's a, for those of you who really want to know this kind of stuff, this is a Angular application. So it's JavaScript on the front end. It has a RESTful API that it calls into. That API is written in Java and built on a Redis database and I'm hosting it in AMS. So I've got this running here. The idea of this is that basically this is a place where a company would store its invoices. And if you're not familiar with the concept of an invoice, it's basically the same as a bill. So for instance, you receive a bill for your electric payment uh, that you make each month. Companies, when they receive a bill, they receive what's called an invoice instead. So maybe your bills are entitled invoices as well. But this is basically a place where a person, would, a company would collect up these invoices before payment and keep the status of them. So you can create an invoice here in this add invoice page. And I'm going to make up something that just looks silly and put in some silly data here for us uh, just to expose to you some of what's going on. I clicked create. And it takes us back to this invoice page. It shows us that an invoice number ASDF has been created. Clearly, there are some issues with the application if we can create an invoice number with characters in it, I'm guessing, or only characters in it. But just to kind of show you how this works, that is how it works. Now, we can also access the back end through an HTTP request. And the way that we do that is by calling this invoices endpoint. And you can see here that the very same invoice, if you look here, we have invoice number ASDF, it's the very same as what's over here. So we can kind of show this is exactly the same. This is the source of that data. <clears throat> and if we were to go through and add more invoices, we would see more in this interface as well. So that's kind of what's going on here. Now, I'm also going to use Eclipse as my tool to show off the test cases. I've got test cases written in JUnit. Uh, they're using WebDriver from Selenium in order to call the browser and to do things in the browser and to verify what's going on in the application. Um, I do have some other tools here that I'm using as well, and we'll get into those when we need them. I'm going to get us into a nice runnable state first by cleaning out the database. I'll get back into this about what's going on in what I just called earlier, but you can see 
the RESTful side, you see the uh, the endpoint is responding with an empty data set here. And you can see here, if we go into the invoices pane again, there are no longer any invoices here. So we're in a clean state. So let's start by talking about the elementary strategy. And what I've done is I've created a very simple test case uh, for each of these strategies. So we'll go through elementary, refresh, and selfish data generation. These three each look very much the same. I'm going to talk to you about how they're set up. So the test case that we're doing is adding an invoice. So what we want to do is go into the application, create an invoice, and then test to make sure that the invoice is there. And the way that we're validating that it's there is we'll look into this particular table and we'll count the number of rows that are there. Now that may not be the most accurate uh, that may not be the most accurate way to do this or the very best way to do this in your mind, but it is simple and it is something that we do very effectively right now uh, together. Um, sorry, I've got a little bit of problem with my recording here, so I'm trying to close down a few applications so that maybe that'll be a little bit better. So let's see how this works. So number one, we've got a setup. So setup is going to run before the test case runs, and it's going to call into the super, which is this invoice test class here. Um, so let's drill down in there and see what setup does. And here it is. Basically, we're going to create a Chrome driver, uh, and we're going to use that throughout the course of this particular test as it runs. It, we set up an implicit wait, just wait 10 seconds um, for things to happen. So that's really all that's done there. We set the base URL to our application. Base URL is uh, composed here, and we've got a configuration that gives us the application IP. I've kind of hid that from you because I don't want everybody banging on the same IP address at one time. The max here is, uh, is just maximizing the window so that you all can see it. Hopefully you're going to see it right over in this area here as we're going through this. The teardown is pretty simple. It'll run after the test. And the teardown basically makes sure that if there is a driver that we quit it and then set it to null and we're done. The add invoice test, this is the actual test that we're going to do. This is the, the set of checks that we will do. I'm using the page object model here. And in the page object model, add invoice page. That would be this page right here, add invoices. And what that looks like um, is this. Let's go, let's go look at it. Add invoice page. It has a bunch of ways to access the elements in the page. And many of you right away will say, hey, that's XPath, and I hate using your XPath, and you should never use it. And I totally get that, totally understand it. It's a conversation that I'd be more than happy to have at another time. For this example, this was the quickest, easiest way to get this running for you all. Um, and I hope that you appreciate that there is a, a working application here with working examples. And I'd be more than happy to share with you these examples um, from, from GitHub if you want them. Just send me an email, paul at beauffortfairmont.com, and I'd be more than happy to give you the link to that GitHub spot. But basically, each one of these represents a way to locate an item on the page. So the invoice number div input is this input over here for the invoice number. The company name is the input for this one. And there you have it. Those are, those are uh, the ways that we locate things. The second part of this, there's a declarative versus an imperative style of creating applications and creating test cases. And that's something that you probably want to look up and spend some time searching through and understanding what's best for you. In general, what I like to do is to have an imperative um, style. And what that means is that we're hiding the implement details from people so that we can make it easier to read. And in this case, I, I hope that this is pretty easy to read. We've created an add invoice page, then we use that page to create an invoice, and then we use an invoices page to get the invoice count, then we use the row count to assess whether or not we have the right amount of rows. The create invoice part of the add invoice page, if you want to see what it does, you can drill down into it here. And this method I've just hard coded in, this data object, which has our invoice number followed by the company name, followed by the type of business they do and a price and all these things. And then we call create invoice with that. And create invoice is what knows how to do these things. So it clicks add invoice, which I can drill into it. It would just be finding an element, calling click on it. Then we're going to go into each one of these and clear out a particular field and send keys to a particular field and those types of things all throughout here. So this is the implementation that we don't necessarily need to know. And if you could think about it from the perspective of someone 
who is trying to understand if a test case works, if they look and they see all of these fine elements and whatever else, it makes it very difficult to understand what's going on in the test case. And if instead you can look at a particular test case and say, oh, we create an invoice and then we assess, did we get the right road number back? That's pretty simple to look at, pretty simple to understand. So hopefully it's um, that way for folks when they come back and read through this later. The next part of this, we go get the invoice count. Basically all that's doing is there's another page object called invoices page and it's counting the rows in that particular table. If you look back here, it's counting these rows and that gives us a row count. We only want to create one. We start, we're assuming that this is an empty data set. We're going to create one and make sure that there's one there later. So what could possibly go wrong? Let's run this and make sure that it works. So I'm using a JUnit runner. You can see over on the left-hand side, filling in the data in the application and then checking to make sure that it's right. You see a big green bar here, which is terrific. It means it worked, okay? So our test case passed. Now, let's go back over here and if we just don't trust things for some reason, let's make sure, okay. So yes, this is the same application. We do have a new invoice here. All these pieces of data look exactly the same as what we would expect and what we, the hard-coded values were to put this into the application. So what's gonna happen if we run this again? Right, it's gonna, it's gonna fail because we've already created that very same invoice and there will be a constraint, a uniqueness constraint on the ID. For whatever reason, this particular application uh, allows us to put in the invoice number but then gives a problem on the input, gives a problem to the user when you try to create it again. Really, if we were creating this a better way, we might have a solution like having the application internally assigned an invoice number if that's going to be kind of a primary key for our database, but this application did not. One of the things you may have noticed when I ran that is that a dialog box popped up for the application. And the dialog box said basically that we had a conflict on the invoice number. In fact, we've taken that output and put it into our error messaging here. And it says the alert text was, Failed to update invoice, all fields must be filled and invoice cannot be the same. Invoice numbers cannot be the same. So that's why we failed there, just like we were expecting. And we should also see over here that we only have, hopefully we only have one invoice still, and we do. Now this would work if we went through and deleted everything and, oh, by the way, aha, what if we just deleted the entire database each time? So that gets us back to the refresh database strategy or refresh data source strategy. I've implemented here as deleting the entire database in all rows in the database. That is not something that is possible in most scenarios. We can't just go through in most applications and delete the entire database and expect to be okay with that. That's not a realistic scenario. It's not something that will work in most environments. Now there are environments where it'll work and it'll work quite effectively. Um, for instance, if you have a very transient type of application like a mobile app that doesn't keep any data on it or whatever, maybe every time it starts up there's no data and it calls out to something, some service somewhere and gets data into it. But in most cases that's not going to be a very realistic thing that we can do. In fact, it's certainly not realistic to be able to go through and blow away an entire database between executions of single test cases anyway. But I want to be able to make these explanations and examples bite-sized chunks that we can all take with us and understand with what we're doing today and know how we can move forward using that knowledge. I want you to be able to understand this and, and move forward with it from this point forward. You probably won't ever use one of these strategies alone by itself. You'll probably take these and many other strategies that I've written about in other places and take them, put them together and, and and, and combine them in different ways that work for your organization, for your environment, for your test environment. <clears throat> what you'll notice here, I've got the elementary strategy on the left and the refresh strategy on the right. And you'll see immediately that the setup method on the left and the refresh strategy is a little bit longer. And what I've done in order to implement a refresh strategy is before the test case runs, I go in and I delete all the invoices. So luckily we've got an API that's exposed by the developers called uh, delete all invoices. And what I'll do, I'll show you how this works. Um, here is where the invoice is specified, or the endpoint is specified, it's called delete all endpoints. We just go in there, create a connection, uh, set the method, connect to it, make sure that we get the right response back. 
and uh, bail out if we have other issues. But that's basically all that guy does. In our examples, I was refreshing the data source before each test execution, and I'm doing that here as well. Now, a lot of people want to clean things out after they run tests, and I can understand where sequentially and logically that might make sense. I like to start with a clean slate, and I like to do that because in my experience, what tends to happen is as we're writing a test framework, we're going to fail a lot. We're going to have runtime problems that are going to affect us. And those runtime problems are going to happen as we're developing the framework. And so we're going to end up with a dirty database if we don't clean it beforehand. If we, if we clean it afterwards, we aren't going to get to that part of the code. We're going to bomb and not clean up the database. And then our subsequent runs will not work. So I very much like to start out with something clean. It also eliminates problems where someone else portion of a test case, and maybe they were debugging and just killed that uh, process, and it left the database in an unmanageable or unhappy state, and then we could come back later and run this because we cleaned up in advance. So uh, once again, this is not real world, I mentioned that here in the comments. Uh, usually your refresh is going to be much more complicated. Many places have to do something like grab data out of production and pull it in rather than just a simple delete like this. Maybe they have to delete specific data or specific types of data. Maybe they have to reset certain fields and certain types of data. Um, but generally, the refresh would be something like pulling something out of production or resetting a database or going back to an older um, and earlier virtual instance of a system or of a database or something along those lines. That's the idea there. Um, the teardown here looks exactly the same. You'll notice it's the same lines of code on the left and the right. The add invoice test looks exactly the same, and it should. We're just basically trying to make elementary strategy work. Is basically all we're trying to do here. So, uh, so let's run this and see if it works. You'll notice we we have things in our database here. We have items in our database. So we should should be able to prove that refresh data source will work regardless of what's existing in the database initially just from this one run. Although I'm going to run it more than once just to take away all doubt for everyone watching this. So we saw that run over there on the, the side of the screen. We see a green bar here in JUnit. I'm going to, and we also see <clears throat> in our table here and in the RESTful API that we've got this very same piece of information. And we've hard coded in all these values. So what we should see is the very same values in here again the next time we run it, and only one, only one invoice. So let's do that again. Let's run this guy. See what happens here. We can see that running, see all the inputs being put in. It's run, um, and we get a green bar again. You and I can very easily go in here and see. We've still got the one row of data. We didn't have any conflict. On, if, we, if the same data had existed already, we would have failed the test because we would have had a conflict on the invoice number. So remember that that it would have told us that there was a problem with this and that our strategy wasn't working originally. So let's take this a step further and let's look at the next strategy, which is the selfish data generation strategy. And if you remember, this one just creates whatever data it wants. It does not have a cleanup strategy associated with it. So you'll see there's no cleanup here in the selfish data generation test. Uh, you'll also notice the teardown is exactly the same. And you'll see that the test has changed, and it had to change a little bit. Let's think about this. If we're always going to put in unique data, and I'm using random, some random tools to kind of get what I hope is unique data into the system. If you're creating unique data each time uh, you're, and you're not cleaning up, then the number of rows in that table is going to keep building up and keep building up. And what we want to do is make sure that, uh, that, we, that we test for that. So instead of just making sure that there's only one row, now we're going to have many. So before we run our create invoice code, we're going to get the original row count, what, what the count was in that table before. And then we're going to use that plus one as the verification for the row count that we get back after we create the invoice. Now the create invoice, um, A 
the Ruby community, you can see where I imported it from right there, Git, uh, github.javafaker.faker. And that guy, he came out of the Ruby community, he's got bindings from, for all different kinds of languages now, TSSR, are whatever language you're using he has, I know they have it for C-sharp and Java, and I believe for Python, and Python has other mechanisms for this as well. But basically we're using Faker to create random data I've got a data object here, it's called invoice data, and what that looks like is just a very simple POJO, a plain old Java object. It's got uh, properties for just, and that's basically it, it's got a few properties to represent an invoice. This was just one way for me to kind of put data together and be able to easily manage it within the code. So there's an invoice number, there's a company name, a type of work, an amount, a status, a due date, and a description. And you'll notice those are all the same fields that we have here, right, in the, in the web application. The, uh, you see the constructor here, so, and that's what we call before. And, and so these are in the order that we would expect the same order as in the UI. I've tried to keep it consistent. Invoice number, company name, type of work. If we go back to our call into here from generate, you see the call to the constructor here. And the first thing we put in is a, a random number from Faker. And that's five digits long. You notice that when I was doing this before, I was putting in five digit long invoices. There's not a constraint in the system for that. I just thought that it would be, it, it would look nice and uniform as we went through this for an example. Um, Faker will give you something like a company name, so it'll create a fake company name with something that looks like a company name. It'll also give you words, so you can get a Latin word and put it into the system here. That's what we're doing. The price is something that you can get. It's got this commerce method that you can get a price out of, so you can get something that looks like a price each time. Um, status is one that I actually made up, so let's go and look at what this is. It's a method here, and basically what, what it is, is it's looking into this array. So I created this statuses array, and you know, Faker isn't going to provide us with the statuses from our application. Faker doesn't know anything about the statuses from our application. We know about that. That's something that we're going to look at, something that we have to take responsibility for, write custom code for. So I just kind of looked at this and said, hey, look, there's four different opportunities, um, paid, sent, draft, past due, and then I made an array with those four items in it, draft, paid, sent, pass due, uh, and I refer to that down here in my call to status, which is just gonna get me a random status. The way that it does that is by getting a random number between zero and four, not inclusive of four, so zero through three, which happens to be an index, the proper index, a valid index into the statuses array, and it returns whichever value it wants. So that was just a quick and easy and dirty way of getting that to work. The, the next thing we do here is, so we've created that invoice. We're gonna get the row count, we talked about this. We're gonna compare the original row count plus one, make sure that that's equal to the row count. So we ought to be able to run this anytime, anywhere, and just have it run and work. So let's run as a unit test and see if it works here. And it did work. It did work. So if you look over here, you've got a green bar, which in JUnit and many of these tools tells you that we passed all of our checks within this test. And <clears throat> we've run it and it worked. We had other data in there before. If we go back and look at here, we can see now there are two line items. There are two items in our table. And the second one has this random looking ID. It's got this random looking company name, Rolfson Rolfson. Uh, it used a Latin word just like we expected in type of work, it's got a price that it created, a date, which happens to be today's date, um, and a description in Latin and a random status. So, you know, we ought to be able to run this as many times as we want and get a passing test because we're creating hopefully unique data now. In this case, I've only got a five-digit ID and it's not zero filled, so we have one out of nine ninety thousand chance of having the same ID each time. So we shouldn't have that, um, but as we run this and create more data in the database, we'll have a better and better chance of having collisions on that invoice number. So it's not something not, not something that you would want to run all the time, and that's something that I'll come back to and say, 
you know, we've, we've talked about the idea that we have different strategies for this, different creational strategies and different cleanup strategies. And in most cases, you're going to use some type of combination of those. And it may not be the case that you can only use one in your environment. Most of the time what I see is a client will sit down and try to use one of these at one point, and they'll try to use another one at another point, and at some point someone will say, hey, what if we use both of those together? So this is kind of an iterative growing process. It tends to evolve for companies over time. And sitting down and trying to say, oh, I want to think about my data strategy in advance and have it all figured out in advance. Well, maybe you can do that in your case. Not everyone can. Uh, so that's just something to remember is to, I see a lot of success when folks are willing to try new things and to see things um, grow over time and evolve over time. So the strategy you use on day one may not be the same as the strategy you use on day 200. So just keep that in mind. These, these things tend to evolve. Um, you know, one of the things that I did in here, so we've gone through all three of those and we saw each of those work very quickly. One of the things that I didn't talk about very much was this data cleaner. So if you remember, the data cleaner is the thing that will go in and it'll hit this endpoint, delete all invoices. And I think this is, uh, there's a couple things here. So in this particular situation, we have the situation where developers have been willing to create an API endpoint that will help us in running our tests. And many times having a utility like this that can do these things can be incredibly helpful. The fact that we didn't have to go through any UI in order to delete all the data and to get back to a healthy state is tremendous because one call to this particular API took you know, 0.05 seconds or whatever it is. Running through a UI to do those same things might take a very long amount of time. So when you're looking at things like how long do our test cases take to run, this can be incredibly helpful. It can also help in lowering the amount of code that you have to maintain over time. It can help with these flaky UI tests. So if you've got a lot of setup code that's done through the UI, that can be incredibly difficult and brittle to maintain over time, to debug over time, and to understand over time. So this is one way to get around that. The idea of having folks on your team create API endpoints for your specific uh, testing is one that is sometimes is kind of hard to comprehend for folks. And it really comes down to how we view our testing and our test automation code. Do we, for instance, view test code as a second class citizen? Is it worth us to create new code in the application just for testing? And these are things that only you can answer in only your environments and, and in only your companies. But these are things that I love talking with with my clients and kind of understanding where they're at. And not every client that's going to be in the same place, not every individual is going to be. In some cases, it may make no sense for developers to implement things that would help testers. Uh, it may be that there are significant pressures that cause us to not be able to do that. And I try to be very understanding of that with my clients. They're all in very different places. Now, I personally have a great affinity for us all being able to work together on the same product. I, I like thinking of testing as a first-class citizen and that without testing, it's very difficult to find the measures of quality we need and that we want in the products that we're producing for our customers and for our brands. And so when we all work together, and we're all creating things that can, can help with that quality and help put it in more quickly and faster and deliver liver faster, um, that can be a very good thing for a lot of companies. So I really like that type of work, working together on one team. So um, just a couple of my thoughts about that. The other thing that I'll mention about this as a utility is many times when I'm writing code that will go in and clean up a database or delete certain rows in a database or do queries for certain kinds of data so that I can use them uh, within my testing, I like to write those utilities as standalone utility so that I can call them later on one way or the other and you'll see that I even have a main method down here to be able to do that specifically. Um, I also had unit tests that are wrapped around this when I was creating it and so that's another thing that you would want to make sure of. I like to test utility code for my test frameworks. I don't like to test tests. Uh, I feel like by running the tests with a certain set of expectations in my mind and making sure that I give my test, the ability and scenarios to fail properly, uh, to fail improperly, and to succeed properly or 
improperly, I give enough scenarios to know exactly whether or not the test will work, and I'm also testing it against an application that has certain expectations, so I ought to be able to see what's going on there. But with, with anything that's more complicated than a specific test, anything that's a utility or anything that runs as a part of the framework that's a little more complicated, I generally wrap that with unit tests or some type of test uh, that's automated so that I know that my testing framework works all the time, and if someone changes it, um, or, or if it changes somehow, some way, or the system changes, we can know exactly what's going on. So just a few of the thoughts there. We went through elementary, uh, we went through the refresh strategy, we went through selfish data generation. Once again, selfish data generation is about uniqueness. I'm trying to accomplish that through using random versions of the data. Uh, I think we've covered everything here. I want to look back very quickly at uh, a slide and give you a few more pieces of information before I let you go. Um, I really appreciate your time and for you being here. The icons that I've used in some of these drawings come from the Noun project, and these are the artists who have created those. And in order to use those icons, I reference them here. I really appreciate that great artwork. I love the Noun project, and I love the icons that they create. This is an American number. If you're in another country, you'll need to use the uh, one exchange number in front of this. But this is our phone number. Give us a call. I love talking through your test automation problems, your test automation challenges. Uh, when I talk about this with other people, I learn new things about test automation in general. It helps me challenge my own assumptions. It helps me better perform and be better prepared to work with another company. Uh, I don't ever share private information, of course. Everything uh, is I share ambiguously, um, and I, I mask out as much as possible so the folks that nothing's shared, uh, everything's confidential in these calls. But I love talking with folks about what's going on, what their experiences are, what their challenges are. Call me for that. I have a podcast called Reflection as a Service. Um, it's about software engineering and entrepreneurship. We tend to do one episode as software engineering, another as as entrepreneurship. It's a, it's a good podcast. We've been doing it for a few years now and had quite a bit of success with that. Uh, people tend to love it, so make sure to check that out. I do writing on the corporate blog, so go for fairmont.com slash blog. You can always find recorded versions of these webinars and the next webinar coming up on our webinars page, so go for fairmont.com slash webinars. Finally, my email, paul at beauforfairmont.com. Find me on Twitter, dpaulmerrill. I love to talk about testing, to see really great articles and blog posts about testing, to hear questions and to talk through thoughts and challenges on Twitter. Great place to find me. I'm very active on there. Um, and I also like to tweet out a lot of information about testing and about what's going on in the testing industry and what other leaders in the testing industry are doing. So make sure to check that out. We're also on Facebook, so check out Bo for Fairmont on Facebook. Once again, I really appreciate your time. I'm so glad that you're here with me today. Um, at Bo for Fairmont, we do we, we work on test automation. That's what we do. So if you're trying to accelerate test automation within your environment, we can help. If you're looking to deliver software faster, with lower risk, uh, to mitigate risk, and to find mechanical ways of mitigating risk. That's what we do. We love working with teams that are doing hands-on testing and want to supplement that with test automation or want to find ways to do it faster with test automation or assistance of, uh, of automation. Those are all ways that we like to do these things. We work with companies in a few different methods. Number one is by training. Number two is by consulting. And number three is finally by hands-on work. So whether you've got a project to do, you want to take your team and upgrade their skills, uh, whatever it is, we like to do that. We love working in open source tools, um, lots of different languages in our tool set, lots of different tools out there that we've used, and we just look forward to, to working with you. So give us a yell, um, and I look forward to talking to you soon. I hope this has been very helpful, and I'll probably be reaching out to you if you've read, if you've seen this, about what you thought about this presentation and how it is affecting you as you move forward with your test automation and what are your challenges. I like to get to know the people, not only who saw this webinar live, but also those who came back and saw the recording later on. Because I, I want to know, you know, what are your thoughts? What can I do better on one of these presentations? And what's going on with your environment? So give me a yell and we will talk soon. Thank you so much for your time and have a really great day.